Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Count On It. Um, we are going to talk about uh, strategies you can use to teach students with autism in preschool, um, in the elementary grades, and um, even older students who uh, need some support um, when learning math skills. This webinar is hosted by the Florida Atlantic University Center for Autism and Related Disabilities and PEPSA, the Partnership for Effective Programs for Students with Autism. FAU CARD's mission is to provide expert consulting, training, and support at no charge for all people across all race, ethnic, and gender groups with autism and related disabilities, their families, employers, the professionals and community and governmental agencies serving them. FAU CARD's vision is to provide support and assistance with the goal of optimizing the potential of all people across all race, ethnic and gender groups with autism and related disabilities. FAU CARD serves five counties, Indian River, St. Lucie, Martin County, Okeechobee, and Palm Beach County. And um, FAU CARD has three offices, one in Boca Raton, uh, Jupiter, and Port St. Lucie. Uh, FAU CARD offers their services at no charge. Um, they provide family and school consultations, trainings and workshops, public education, referrals and resources, adult hangouts, um, groups, and much, much more. So I'm Lori Wise. Again, welcome. We're going to be talking about math and strategies you can use to teach children. This is just a little cartoon to bring some levity to the uh, challenging moments we have in teaching math. And so in this little cartoon, we have a, a little student and um, his teacher is teaching the equation x plus two equals five. And, and she writes on the board x equals three. And the student is clearly frustrated and he says, just a darn minute. Yesterday, you said that X equals two. Well, the day before, the teacher was teaching um, equations and X did equal two. Um, the student took the value of X at face value um, and was not able to um, understand the abstract meaning of X and that it changes based on its context, its equation, its placement in an equation. Um, math can be very confusing for our children. Um, math involves a lot of language, um, as do reading and writing, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and so, you know, just a, a little cartoon to uh, demonstrate the frustration that um, a lot of our students experience. So today we're going to review math challenges that can be experienced by our students. And we're going to talk about those supports and strategies that can help. Let's talk about the primary challenge, the language, the language that's involved in math. Math is a visual and manipulative skill that is only imperfectly represented by language. Um, word problems, estimation, prediction, these all involve very abstract language. Um, and as our students get older and math becomes more complex, the language gets more complex, causing even more challenge, even more comprehension um, issues. Um, we discussed that reading and writing do involve uh, language. They involve uh, symbolic language, letters, letter sounds. Well, math involves symbolic language as well. Um, and it involves symbolic language in the context of math. Um, and if you think about the language that is involved in, for example, word problems, there are three layers of symbols involved in word problems. We see number symbols. We see words, those letters and sounds, um, as well as operations. 
B plus sign, minus sign, division, et cetera. And then on top of all that, students need to figure out when to apply certain operations. Um, so it becomes very complex. And we take that for granted. For, for students who have language, challenge, language processing challenges, language comprehension challenges, this is a, a, um, a huge challenge for them. And again, something that we take for granted. Um, math can involve many abstract concepts um, that become less and less concrete. Uh, for example, more or less, largest or smallest, more than, altogether. Those are abstract terms. Um, you know, it's one thing to refer to numbers as being large or small, but then when you add in varying degrees, like largest, smallest, it becomes way more complex. Our students tend to have a very literal understanding of language. Um, they uh, often have difficulty making inferences and predicting outcomes, and this does affect reading comprehension, as well as comprehension that's required to resolve math problems. Um, and and uh, receptive and expressive language demands of math can sometimes be uh, very challenging for our students. So um, that comprehension component, but it's also the expressive component. Um, some more challenges that math poses. Uh, the direction of math text is not always left to right. So we read from left to right. We teach our students to read from left to right. Um, but sometimes, and eventually when students are learning math, math has to be solved from top to bottom. That can be confusing for our kids. Um, often remembering number facts and math vocabulary is very taxing on the memory for our students um, and, and memory becomes um, a, a challenge. Often our students lack the generalization skills they need. So they'll learn a math concept in one context or one um, you know, skill area, but then have difficulty applying that skill to another skill area or another learning location or with different people or with slightly different language. So there's a lack of generalization. Handwriting is an issue um, and we're gonna discuss that um, in a little more depth soon, as well as um, inaccurate assessment results. We can talk really a lot about assessment, but just briefly, I want to point out that test scores do not always give the full picture. Um, very often, the language challenges, the handwriting challenges that our kids have prevent them from showing us what they really know. And very often, they know more than they're able to demonstrate. So um, in addition to any assessments that we do in our classrooms, it's really important to, to become an observer. Observe how your student solves a math problem. Watch where they're going wrong. Watch for holes in their strategy. And this might be the best indicator of what areas they're really good at and what areas they need to work on. Um, definitely don't assess their skills based on the time it takes them to complete a task because we know that our students need wait time. We know that they need time to process. So give them that extra time to complete um, a task when we're assessing them. Um, I have to get this out of the way before we go on. You know, very often we feel that students need to master certain skills before we go on and teach subsequent skills. And what we know about how kids learn is that very often they, I'm sorry, very often they will, um, you know, learn skills not to mastery, will have to learn more skills. Um, you know, subsequent skills. And by going on and learning subsequent skills, 
the, the skills that they learned previously become stronger and stronger. Um, children learn by learning in a well-rounded way. And if we wait for students to master one skill before going on, very often we're robbing them of the opportunity to practice more and more skills to fill in that big picture of math learning. I like this quote, um, students should not be required to learn the basics before engaging in problem solving, just as kids learn to read by reading and to write by writing, they learn math by mathing, using mathematical concepts in scenarios based on real life events. So, you know, when we talk about literacy development, children learn to read by reading, they also learn to read by writing. And they learn to write by writing, and they also learn to write by reading. And they learn to write and read by talking. And they learn to write and read and talk by listening. We know that students need to do all of these practice skills in all of these areas all at once in order to develop all of those skills. And the same goes for math. So we can't hold students back as their learning skills. We have to keep going and we have to keep filling that bucket of skills. Just to show the language that's involved in the Common Core State Standards, um, this is the overview of first grade Common Core State Standards. And, um, you know, just take a look at these uh, domains and clusters of goals. Um, this involves a lot of language. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, my, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't use these goals, quite the contrary. I think the common core state standards have been the best thing for our ESE students, um, because, uh, we're held to a, a higher standard to teach our students more and more skills. What my point is, is that our students need even more practice than typical students. These are goals for typical students. Um, and um, it, these goals are difficult for general ed students. Um, our students can achieve these goals, these skills, um, but they're going to need way more practice. Um, here are the rest of the goals for the other domains. So lots of language reason with shapes and their attributes. Again, our students can do this. They just need more practice. And, you know, when we talk about beginning math skills, these are the basics, you know, colors, shapes, categories, numerals and numbers, sequencing and order, addition, subtraction, sizes, positions, money, basic problem solving, and basic geometry. Now, this all involves language. It all involves, you know, basic vocabulary. As we proceed past these basic math skills, the language becomes even more complex. But these are the basic goal, the basic skills that we are going to talk about today. It's important to also mention that early exposure in a very math enriched environment is crucial. When we're teaching children, young children, literacy skills, we um, uh, provide for them an enriched literacy environment with lots of books and lots of words and lots of language and singing and listening and talking. The same goes for math. So. When we talk about a, a, an enriched math environment, we're talking about using the, the child's or the student's area of interest. We might count their favorite things. Let's count the Thomas trains, for example. Um, you want to surround the child with opportunities to engage with numbers and math materials, just like we do with all children, young um, uh, 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 preschool classrooms for young early childhood classrooms, they have, you'll see lots of number puzzles and books involving numbers, uh, number blocks, number stamps. We want our kids to play with this kind of uh, material. Point out numbers all around you. 
Um, look at the numbers on the mailbox is something a parent might say. Um, you might point out certain phone numbers that are hanging up in the classroom. Use, ma use math concepts in real life. Say things like, how many cookies do you want? Or if Fluffy eats one cookie, how many will we have left? Fluffy meaning like a dog at home. Um, so, you know, work on that vocabulary by naturally embedding it in a math enriched environment. Um, that early exposure is really, really important. If a strategy that we're gonna talk about today doesn't work, keep trying. Um, and sometimes a strategy will work and then it doesn't work and that's okay. We have to keep trying and tweaking our strategies based on the needs of our students. Repetition is absolutely crucial for our ESE students, for our students with autism. They need exposure and practice way more than a typical learner does. We have to give it to them. We also have to make learning fun because none of us like to learn or engage in anything that doesn't in make us happy. So we have to figure out how to motivate our students to be interested. Um, and we also have to remember that math happens all day and we need to bank on all of those opportunities. This was a cute little uh, graphic organizer that I found that highlights a math enriched environment. So if we start at the top, uh, you know, just ideas that you can take advantage of in your everyday life to point out to students, um, visual schedules that we may use in our classroom have numbers. Uh, we'll see lots of numbers and math opportunities in a kitchen. So if you're a parent watching this, you may want to, uh, you know, point out things at home in your kitchen, whether you're cooking with your child or just in your kitchen eating. Um, and in the classroom, if you have a kitchen or if you're doing a cooking activity, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, cooking um, involves a lot of um, uh, numbers, measurement, sequencing, comparing. Um, in a classroom, adults might wear a lanyard with different numbers, math concepts, um, things that we can point out to our students, uh, different symbols for uh, representing vocabulary. Um, we want to point out numbers in the community. Um, in the classroom and at home, we may show DVDs that teach uh, the basic math uh, concepts like colors and numbers. Um, and at school, we wanna make sure that we're not just teaching math, like I said, during math time, we wanna make sure we're embedding it throughout our day, taking advantage of all learning opportunities. These are more examples of how we can embed math learning throughout the day. We can involve math when we're at the playground, when there's food in front of us, when we're cooking, during bath time, when we're reading books, using special interests, music, um, whatever routine you're doing with your child, even if it's blowing bubbles, um, count the bubbles. If you're brushing teeth, think about those typical routines that you do with your child every day. When you're brushing teeth, what can you count? The seconds that you're brushing, um, the dots of toothpaste on the toothbrush, embed it throughout the routines. Um, there are so many games that you can play that involve the basic math concepts like bingo, shoots and ladders, so much more. Um, when you're going on a trip, art, shapes, colors, geometry, et cetera. So think about how you can apply math throughout the day. Children do not learn when, when we teach in a very discrete amount of time. We need to show them how it applies throughout the day. These are the strategies that we're going to talk about today. And we're gonna start with individualizing intervention. So our first strategy is individualizing intervention. Each student might need something different. So we start by teaching in a very direct way, direct teaching. Um, and, and that can be more easily individualized. It indicates that we need to meet the, the needs of our students. The first thing we do in this process is we 
try to see um, what our students know about a given skill, um, about what we're going to be teaching. So we have to access their prior knowledge. Then based on what we know they know or don't know, we're going to provide explicit instruction of a target a concept or skill. We're gonna model the use of any strategies that we teach. And then we're gonna provide them with guided practice. We're gonna monitor and provide feedback as we're watching them practice the skills. And we're gonna give them a lot of opportunities to practice the skills with us and in front of us. And then we're going to provide students with independent practice. When we talk about individualizing intervention, um, one strategy that is very effective is called priming. Um, this is a, a behavioral term um, from the field of behavior analysis, and we can use it in the field of education as well. Priming means to, to um, teach our students, to get them ready, to prepare them for what's coming. So if we know we're teaching our students about a specific concept, a specific area of skills, we want to do whatever we can to figure out what they know about that concept and to prepare them to get them ready, to get their brain space ready for what they are about to learn. We also want to consider what kind of learner our student is so that um, as we're preparing our students to learn and when we are delivering that explicit instruction, we are meeting their learning style needs. So, for example, um, we're going to use a multi-sensory approach, but if, for example, we have a student who is um, typically, let's say, an auditory learner. Most of our young students tend to be visual learners and kinesthetic learners, but some are auditory. Um, so if I knew I had an auditory learner, I would, in addition to providing visual and kinesthetic input, I would also use perhaps, let's say I was teaching a concept um, number identification, I might use song or a song or a poem or music, a little jingle to help that student remember the, the concept that I'm teaching. So something that they can hear to promote the skill. Um, again, we want to uh, use multi-sensory input, but we want to also help meet the learning style of our students. We want to always provide more time for those students who need that time. Um, we want to check their comprehension often. Don't wait until the end, but do comprehension checks throughout your teaching. Um, what takes one student 10 minutes to learn might take another student three days of math teaching, of lessons uh, to learn. So every student is going to take a different amount of time and we need to keep providing that practice until they achieve the goal. We need to um, individualize by providing lots and lots of practice. There is no research out there that says our students cannot learn the skills that we're teaching them. But there is research out there that, are, uh, that says that our students can learn. They just need more practice. How do we individualize our teaching, our strategies for students who are not talkers in a conventional way? Well, for one, we wanna give those students choices from which they can choose so that they can still participate in math learning and expressing um, what they know. And we're gonna talk more about this. We also wanna allow for the use of what we call alternative pencils. We're gonna talk about that too. We also need to consider AAC, which is augmentative and alternative communication. And that is providing another way for our students to express 
whether it's through um, a speech generating device or a, uh, 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 an eye gaze system. I'm gonna show you some photos of that in a minute or a communication board or manual signing like sign language. It is helping our students to speak or write in another mode um, without using their voice. These are some examples. Um, this is a speech generating device where the student can touch a symbol and the, uh, the system will speak it out loud for the student. Um, so we can have math vocabulary on this device. We can have numbers, letters, um, uh, shapes, um, vocabulary like larger, um, smaller, et cetera. Um, on the right of the screen, that is an eye gaze system where the student is on one side and the adult is on the other side and the teacher or adult asks a question. And this is, in this case, this example is using yes or no. And the student looks at one or the other, the adult sees what the student is looking at. And so we know what the student is responding. And this is very effective for those students who don't have the ability to touch a symbol um, with their body. Um, so that's an eye gaze system. Um, at the bottom on the left, that is a simple communication board. And that's just something that we can print that the student can point to, to participate um, in terms of language. Um, and then we have manual signing, all right? And that's the manual sign for math. Again, at the top here is a speech generating device. This one on the right is an eye gaze system. And so the adult can see where the student is looking. And often um, on the opposite side of this system, the adult has a copy of exactly what symbol is in that same place on the other side. So that if the student looks up at the top um, left, that the adult knows exactly what symbol is there without looking on the student side. Um, and again, here on the bottom, this is a communication board, and this might be a direct copy of what's on a speech generating device. Um, this is like a simple choice board, a simple communication board, um, uh, uh, giving our students language they can point to. Um, and even if they're not pointing, even if they are verbal, um, sometimes it helps our students to have those choices available to help support their vocal language. Um, so it can be very helpful. And here in this picture, you can see a student using a speech generating device during a math lesson. This is a communication board. You could uh, print this and it might be similar to what would be on a speech generating device as well. These communication boards are readily available online. Um, if you look, you can print them and use them. Um, if students are successful, I would recommend that you speak to the, that you speak to the student's speech therapist um, at school or uh, your private speech therapist um, to discuss what kind of communication system, what kind of AAC system the student would be uh, would benefit from. Um, using visual supports is another way that we can ind individualize instruction. Um, we use visual supports to give directions so that our students understand what's expected of them, uh, to support math concepts, and to maximize comprehension. This is just a little example of patterning and providing a visual to support our students as they learn to make patterns. This clock is a visual support that I used to use in my classroom uh, 25 years ago um, to teach the, the minutes in the five minute increment and to show that um, when the minutes was within that five minute increment that it belonged to a specific hour. And then eventually I would fade away those, that color coding. But this really helped my students learn the concept. Um, this one in the middle, 
is a, a color coded uh, visual to support students when they are learning to, uh, to carry numbers. And then we have a problem solving visual where we have a, a, a graphic organizer that helps our students <clears throat> problem solve what to do first, what to do next, et cetera. <clears throat> This is a visual that helps students understand smaller than and greater than. And we might say, ooh, the bear is really hungry. It wants to eat the bigger number. And we can use this um, concrete visual concept to teach the more abstract con concept. <clears throat> This is a 10 frames visual that uh, teaches students about, um, you know, 10 frames. Uh, the, these are uh, visuals that are used for all students and it can really help our students with autism, um, a really uh, effective visual uh, support, as well as the hundreds, um, uh, you know, very often we'll see this hundreds chart in, preschool classrooms, elementary school classrooms. Um, this is a great visual support to show our students um, the patterns of our numbers and to teach 10 frames as well. This is a great little uh, visual that a parent sent me um, a number of years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. The activity is called subtraction smash. And so the idea is to put the number of um, uh, uh, Play-Doh balls into the boxes based on the equation. So in this case, seven minus four, there are seven little Play-Doh balls and you subtract the number by smushing the Play-Doh balls. And so when you smash four, you have three left and there's your equation. Um, and this was really effective um, for this one parent. Again, creative, it's kinesthetic, um, it's visual, um, great, great activity. Again, these are visual, adding uh, great visual supports, uh, visual supports to teach uh, fractions. This is a little graphic organizer to show the different equations that we can use to, to represent the number five. Touch math is also a visual support. Um, if you're not familiar with touch math, I would encourage you to uh, look it up. But touch math uses the dots on the numbers to teach the value of the number. And so, you know, on one, we point to the dot and we count one. And then we say one, two, one, two, three. When we get to six, seven, eight, and nine, any circles that have another circle, any dot that has a circle around it, um, you count twice. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Once we teach these touch points, um, we can teach our students to add these numbers. So if we do two plus three, we count the dots on the numbers. Eventually we fade away the dots. And as we progress through the, the, the skills, it becomes more and more complex. Um, but we're teaching the concept of counting of the one-to-one uh, -one correspondence each number uh, represents. Um, and it's a really effective tool. Um, and, and I have found that because most of the learners I have taught were visual learners, touch math has been very effective. And eventually students don't need the dots anymore. And that's the goal um, because obviously, you know, numbers are gonna see elsewhere outside of touch math are not gonna have these dots, but it's really effective. And the program even involves um, teaching money skills, teaching time skills. So I would encourage you to take a look. Um, a, a number line is another way that we can support our students visually. And also don't discount the calculator. 
The calculator is something that our students need a lot of practice using. The second strategy is using our words wisely. Um, being careful of the language that we are attaching to the visual structures and the manipulatives that we use to teach when we're teaching numbers and number equations. So, you know, when I talk about um, manipulatives, this is what I'm talking about. These are all manipulatives, things that we use to teach um, numbers, values of numbers, shapes, geometry, patterning, etc. Here's some more. These are all called manipulatives, things that students can manipulate as they're learning. Using um, a, a calendar um, that is a manipulative, and this is math, right? The 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 uh, representation, the representing of time using. Um, this daily planner, for example, manipulating clocks, these are manipulatives. So when I talk about using words wisely, we want to make sure that we're not taking specific language for granted, that we're not um, causing misunderstandings, and we need to watch our students use manipulatives as they are learning and demonstrating knowledge of math skills, so that we can make sure that they understand the vocabulary that we're learn that we're teaching. We want to simplify vocabulary if that is required for our students. We want to individualize directions so that. We're simplifying for those students who don't have the language level needed to, to comprehend and carry out a specific task, task if it's too complex. Um, we wanna provide visual directions um, and uh, visual strategies for problem solving if our students needs, need it to maximize their comprehension. And sometimes we need to remove extraneous language extraneous words that are confusing to our students. Um, so for example, these are some abstract words and we have to teach those abstract words. But sometimes we want to start with the concrete or if our students can, can do this, we wanna pair the abstract concepts, the abstract vocabulary with more concrete vocabulary. And I have to point out that even in this concrete column of words, some of that is still very abstract, but it's a little more concrete than the words in the abstract column. So just you know, take a look at these abstract words and, and words that we can use to simplify a little bit. And then of course, as our students are developing the more concrete vocabulary, we pair it with the more abstract. So we might um, refer to um, a, a group of objects as, um, you know, which one has a lot, which one has a little, which one is smaller, which one is bigger. And then we'll pair that with which has more, which has less, which is slightly more abstract. How much is left? That's also quite abstract for our kids. Um, and so, you know, subtract is, you know, a little more concrete. We, we, can, we pair the word subtract with um, take away the, the, and the symbol minus. Um, but then we also have to teach them that how much is left means we're using the skill of subtraction. Um, so always pair the abstract with the concrete because eventually they will see that more abstract word as they get older, as the math demands get greater. Um, homophones, this can be quite confusing. Um, sum and sum, sign, sign, et cetera, plain and plain. And so, you know, these are all words that students might see um, as they're learning in the classroom, and these can be confusing. We have to teach our students this directly and not assume that they're just going to know which word means what. This was as I was preparing for uh, this lecture, um, 
I guess uh, Google knows what I was researching and I uh, this came up on Instagram, uh, math homophones. So this was a neat, you know, pi versus pi, right versus right, weight and weight, one and one, sum, sum. I mean, this can be really confusing for children who have language challenges. The third strategy is using your inner voice. And um, this is really, really, really important for our students. Um, very often they don't know that they have a voice inside their head that they can use to monitor the strategies that they're using and their comprehension. This is called metacognition. You and I do this quite naturally. We talk to ourselves inside our brain. Do I understand this? Hmm, what am I going to do to make sure I understand this? Hmm, I need to go back and reread the directions. So we do this naturally without realizing it. We need to show our students that they can do the same. And we do that by modeling out loud what we are thinking in our brain. So we want to speak the process out loud. And we might say things like, say it with me in your head as we're doing something together. We might say, I know you can talk in your head. I just can't hear you. But you, you can talk in your head. You do it. It teaches self-monitoring skills. It teaches the use of metacognitive strategies and it establishes comprehension. This is an absolutely crucial skill for our kids to practice under our supervision. And this skill is important for all skill areas, reading, um, writing, general problem solving in life. We always talk to ourselves without realizing. We're, we're, our brain is thinking and problem solving. Our students need to know that they have the ability to do that too. The fourth strategy is making math functional. And I don't mean functional in a traditional way. I mean functional in terms of how they can apply math skills throughout their life. Um, and so one way we do this in early childhood classrooms is using storybooks, finding math in storybooks. So if we're reading, for example, caps for sale, it's really easy to say something like, how many hats does he have on his head? Or how many hats did the monkey steal? Or, um, uh, you know, how many stars are in the sky? There's so many, we can't count. It's infinity. Or how many butterflies? How many does he have left? So we have to take advantage of these opportunities to teach math in a, in a functional way um, that's all, you know, using opportunities that already exist for us. Relate math to everyday contexts and use that math talk. Talk about sharing. Uh, when we're talking about, when we, we want to start to teach our students about fractions, talk about shapes and sizes, money, time, positions of things. So, you know, different things we can say. We might say, take one. This is all math related. How many crackers do you want? There are three students and we have nine mini cupcakes. How many should I give each of you? Which color cup do you want? Who has more juice? Who has less juice? The red team won. They're in first place. The blue team came in second place. And what does this mean? Turn to page 32, all number math related. Give 10 popsicle sticks to each friend, please. This toy costs $3. Let's count the money to see if we have enough. Let's fill your cup halfway. There's a lot of water in this bathtub if your mom at home. It's enough. Enough is a math term. A lot is a math term. So these are things that are naturally occurring that help us make math very functional. 
The fifth strategy is we need to promote a positive attitude about math in our classrooms and in our homes. Um, children take their cues from us. And if we promote math in a positive way, they are going to feel more positive about math as well. So provide additional motivation and reinforcement if needed. Um, you can use token boards or any other uh, form of reinforcement. Um, if you need um, advice on how to use a token board, feel free to reach out to me or your local card center. Um, my contact information will be at the end of this webinar. Uh, make positive statements about math. Um, hmm, it's really important that I learn how to count this money because it can help me buy that toy I want. Negative would be, I was never good at math. I know this is hard or I'm not good at math. Um, we, we want to be positive. We want our students to develop that positive attitude and include their interests in math, um, in, in math tasks. So if they're interested in specific characters, um, have that character on the token board or count little figurines of that character or stickers of that character, but include their interests so that they're motivated and feel positive about math learning. Um, it's important to consider that motivational systems are used to motivate, not to coerce students into participating. So when I'm talking about using motivational systems like token systems and reinforcement, I am talking about exciting our students. I'm talking about getting them to want to, to participate, not to feel forced to, to participate because we want them to. The sixth strategy is we need to accommodate handwriting. And this is where we're gonna be talking about those alternative pencils. Handwriting can be so energy consuming for our students and this fatigues them cognitively. This causes poor memory, sloppiness, poor organization and inaccuracy. Um, many, many years ago, uh, I had a student in my classroom who, he was probably at the time in fourth grade, third grade or fourth grade, and we had been working on single digit addition for months and months and months, and he was not making progress and he would get the answer one day and by the next day, he would not perform the same way and the same uh, addition problem, he would answer incorrectly. And one day I decided to use number stamps. Um, and I discovered that when I gave him number stamps, the answer was always correct. The, um, the, the, the handwriting, the demands of handwriting and coming up with the correct answer and then getting it out on paper correctly was causing a lot of problems for this young student. And so the stamps took that handwriting component away and he was able to get, he, he, he clearly knew the answers when given another way to respond. Um, and that was a huge aha moment in my teaching career. Um, within a few weeks, we were doing three-digit addition, double-digit subtraction. Um, he was just flying because I gave him another way to respond. Um, when we give our students alternative pencils, they can better show us what they know. Um, when we take away that handwriting component, if it's challenging for them. And it is often way more challenging for our students than we think it is. So these are alternative pencils. We can give our students stamps, stickers, like, um, you know, those little stickers that we put prices on for garage sales. You can use those stickers. They sell little stickers. You can use big stickers, whatever you want and use a Sharpie marker and write numbers, you know, take a whole sheet of stickers and write the number one on each sticker and number two on another sheet and let the students choose the stickers they want as their answers. 
Students can type using a keyboard. Um, they can dictate answers. Choosing multiple choice answers um, is, is really effective for our students. Uh, using graph paper to help organize our students if they are writing, it helps keep them um, the numbers lined up and less confusing. And by the same token, you can also use line paper uh, turned around so that the, the vertical lines is where students can do those vertical equations. I'm going to stop for a moment here. Um, and I want to share with you how you can obtain your certificate of completion. Um, you must fill out the form at the certificate of completion link provided on the email for this training. Um, and please write down the code that I'm about to give you as it will be required to receive your certificate. Um, the code is L capital L capital W zero two two zero two two so again this code is capital l capital w zero two two zero two two all right so this is an example of providing an alternative pencil this is a way for the student to choose a correct answer without having to write. And in this case, they're using clothespins to select the correct answer from choices. This is another way. Um, I had little library card holders and I would have the equation written down on the library, uh, the library card holder and students would select the correct answer and put it into the holder. More accommodations. Um, we want to offer alternative ways for our students to demonstrate the skills that they know. Um, uh, we want to allow for additional time. We want to reduce sometimes the number of examples that they're required to complete. If our students get um, 10 examples, 10 items correct, there is absolutely no reason to require them to, to do 30 examples. Let's stop at 10. Um, for older students, it helps them to have an outline to help them take notes. Um, we might even provide a study guide for them to help, um, uh, help them see what the relevant information is in certain lessons. Um, and then for some of our students, we just give them notes. Um, it is a very helpful um, support and um, they can perform uh, you know, with success when given those notes. Here are some examples of how we can change the tasks that we're giving our students. Uh, you know, the example on the left has 21 items. Uh, a student might look at that and be completely overwhelmed by all of those numbers and, um, and you know, just the, the lack of space, but also the number of items. And so a quick fix is just cutting out one of those columns and having the student do column by column or just one column. Uh, same goes for this multiple multiplication and division worksheet. Um, instead of all of that on one sheet, um, let's give our, our students more space. And we might also color code the operation. If they're still at the stage where they're learning um, which operation to use, um, it might help to point out to them, hey, pay attention to what you need to do here. This can be a very effective modification. Um, this worksheet on the left, that font is not so great for our students. Um, and so we might redo this worksheet for our students. More space, they, have a, they can see where they should be working out the equation. Um, we're making this worksheet more efficient, less overwhelming, and the font is more clear. 
Now you can't see in this example, it didn't scan properly when I put this exam, when I scanned this example, but each of these numbers down here is written on a round colored sticker. And so I would provide my students with a whole bunch of numbers and they select the correct sticker and place it next to the equation. They don't need to handwrite. We can practice handwriting at another time, but this is math. Our students need to practice math, not handwriting. So let's remove that handwriting demand and make this doable for them. Again, we redid this worksheet to make it bigger, more workspace. Here's another one, we enlarged it. And the seventh strategy is minimize distractions. Very often, if our students have sensory integration challenges, sensory dysfunction, um, those sensory um, needs are very distracting to their learning. So we wanna make sure that we're addressing any sensory needs um, so that um, they can focus on what we're teaching. And we also wanna make sure that they have a clean and organized workspace. Again, help them focus on the relevant stimuli. And the eighth strategy is teach our students to problem solve with, to problem solve word problems specifically. Um, this is the hardest thing to teach because of the language demands of this skill. We need to teach it from a young age, starting with very beginning word problems. Represent word problems in a visual way. Use graphic organizers, pictures, manipulatives, charts, graphs. Help our students understand the word problem in a visual way. And teach your student or child to create their own visuals eventually. We want them to see how using visuals and creating their own visuals can help them problem solve. We also need to teach our students how to use the visuals that we're using. We can't assume that just because it's visual, they'll be able to use it. We need to show them how they can use those visual representations to problem solve and to identify the main idea of problems. You may wanna remove um, unnecessary words from the problem and highlight important information. Um, so you may want to simplify word problems or just use a highlighting marker to highlight what they need to pay attention to. As word problems become more advanced, uh, they often involve um, excess words so that um, they're requiring students to focus on the relevant information, the relevant vocabulary. They have to choose which words are important and which are not. Let's help them out as they're learning this skill. Change pronouns in the problem to make it easier to know who's being referenced in the word problem. So sometimes in a word problem, there are lots of he's and she's. Um, change those he's and she's to the actual names that are being um, referenced in the word problem to make it less confusing for our students. Um, and finally, you know, addressing reading comprehension in general in other content areas is absolutely crucial. So, um, you know, uh, teaching word problems are, uh, it's a reading comprehension issue, it's a language comprehension issue, so we want to make sure that we're teaching reading comprehension, um, we're, we're teaching writing skills, we're practicing language, and we're working on those skills throughout the child's life. Um, these are some uh, ways that we can modify word problem uh, um, tasks. If I was a student and I looked at this worksheet, I would freeze because this is overwhelming. Lots of text, nowhere for me to use any visuals. Um, and um, I, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the accommodation where I've highlighted the relevant information so the student uh, can focus on what is important and pay attention to the important words. And there is space for the student to create 
her or his own visual. So very important to give them that room. Here's another way that we can show a, a visual representation of a word problem. David has $4, Alejandra has $3. They wanna buy ice cream that costs 10. Do they have enough? Enough is very abstract. Could we possibly represent the language of this word problem this way? There's David, he has $4, Alejandra has $3. Together, they have $7. And look, using our visual of greater than or smaller than, do they have enough? Here's another one. The Moe's candy store sells a lot of delicious items. You can buy it all. Sweet tarts cost $1.60. Chocolate bars cost $2.25. Popcorn costs 75 cents. How much money do you need to buy all those items? This is a simple visual representation to teach our students how to extract the relevant information in all that language and solve the problem. I just want to tell you about this great resource, um, Number Talks, it's called, and they have it for various grade levels. Um, this is a really nice um, strategy. Uh, it, they have different level, uh, different lessons, and each lesson offers you tips. Um, it offers you things that you can say. And I love the leading questions that these lessons involve. Each question builds up upon the one before, um, and it really teaches students to think. Um, we're, the, the questions and the tips lead us to model what we are thinking in our heads as we solve these problems. And so it really encourages our students to use um, our guiding questions and our think aloud strategies to help them incorporate those skills as well. Um, so just a program that I like. This is another example. You can see it, it's a little larger. So some of the questions, you know, what do you see? Can you use jumps on a number line to show the answer? Um, what number sentence can you use to find your answer? And you can model all of these skills as you think out loud, as you're dialoguing about these questions. And these are meant to do daily, just little tidbits of math lessons. And it involves a lot of language um, and visuals. So to take away, um, I, I've shared a lot with you. Uh, remember that language, including the language of math, is learned in context. So we need to apply the language of math throughout our children's day. Um, math lessons, in addition to everyday activities, are a very appropriate opportunity to teach very useful language. Um, being immersed in a math-enriched environment is crucial to the generalization of math skills and the comprehension of math concepts. Um, and as you have seen, as I've shared with you, there are very specific strategies that can be used to increase math skill acquisition. And remember that as you apply and implement these specific strategies, you always have to take another look, take a step back. Is the strategy still working? What do you have to tweak? to make it effective. The next number of slides have a number of references that you may want to look into for additional support. I have um, used some of this material in this lecture. Here are some additional resources that you may want to find. Here are a few books that involve math and math concepts, and you can find more um, at this website that's down here below.
So I want to thank you for attending this webinar. Um, if you have any questions and you would like to contact FAU CARD, um, here is their phone number, their email address, and their website. Their phone number is 561-297-2055. They can be emailed at card at fau.edu, and their website is www.autism.fau.edu. And here is my contact information down below, my phone number, my email address. If I can support you in any way, um, please let me know. Um, I work for uh, the University of Miami, Nova Southeastern University, Center for Autism and Related Disabilities. Uh, we love to collaborate with other CARD centers such as FAU CARD. Um, and it's been my pleasure to be here today sharing these strategies with you uh, so that you can teach young children math skills and support them adequately and, eff and effectively. And um, if I could support you in any way, please feel free to contact me. Thank you again for attending. Um, it's been a pleasure.